There, there you go. Okay. All right. <laughs> I can share this here. Oh, this is going to be interesting tonight. Oh, there he is. Give me a dull moment. Terry, we can't wait. All right, how's that look? Beautiful. All right. Uh -oh. All right, there we go. All right, so this is me. Simple, easy. I'm going to make room for my wife. Retired Homeland Security Special Agent. I'm a retired U.S. Army CID agent. I did continuous service in the military from 1974 until 2015. That's 41 years, I think. But my math is right. That's both active and reserves. I was stationed at Aberdeen Improvement Grounds, Camp Humphreys, Korea, Fort Lee, Fort Belvoir twice, Fort Sam Houston, the Pentagon, and Fort Bragg. Oh, I did say that. 41, 41 years total service. 10 of those were acted, uh, in which I got activated twice. I got a bachelor's degree from Radford University that I took my real GI Bill and went to school full time. And after I was, did eight years active duty and then took my GI Bill, went to school full time because I had a warrant officer that didn't like me and kind of pushed me out <laughs> a little bit. But I stayed in the reserves and continued to march. So there we go. When were you at Aberdeen? Uh, 74 and 75. No, wait a minute. Go back. Okay. I was there in like 80, 80 well, heck, 82, I think it was. Was it? <laughs> I'm a, so this is, my, uh, this is my Rotary stuff. I'm a charter member of some of the leading Rotary clubs, started in 2000, which started in 2010. I'm the district uh, database manager for DACDB. It's the competitor to um, Club Runner. I'm the president of the Whiskey Dram, which is Whiskey Drinking Rotarians and Members Fellowship. Also a membership fellowship of motorcycling Rotarians, obviously. I'm in the Wine Appreciation Fellowship, the Beer Appreciation Fellowship. See kind of a motif here a little bit? You're missing the Rum Fellowship. I, well, that's true. I am missing a Rum Fellowship that just started back up. The, uh, I'm an associate member, obviously, in this ro Rotary Club. I'm in the Police and Law Enforcement Fellowship. I'm a Paul Harris Fellow and member of the Paul Harris Society. I was District Rotarian of the Year in 2018, and I was District Service Above Self Award in 2016. I'm Re Request Society and a major donor and an RLI graduate. Okay, that's all the Rotary stuff we're going to talk about. <laughs> this, is, this is more about my life, my career. I was in custom, Immigration Customs Enforcement. Uh, we're, do, we're tasked to protect national security, secure the borders, immigration enforcement all of which is a discussion whether we do it good or not, I don't know. But you can see the difficulty here. This is San Ysidro. You're going too fast. Well, I got a lot to cover. <laughs> My wife says I'm going too fast. This is San Ysidro Port of Entry Crossing. Um, 2,500 cars per hour, I think is what I last learned. It's probably a little more now because I knew they were widening this making more lanes. It's probably more than that. I'm sure it's more than that. This is a good bit of what our border does look like. It's pretty. It's gorgeous. Beautiful fencing. This is me in the Yuma, Arizona desert with this sign. It was kind of a joke saying, you know, smuggling's illegal. Don't come into this area. Might, you might encounter people. This is Arizona looking to the left and California looking to the right. Notice the gate wide open in California. Nice fencing on the left. These are issues that those states got to work out together. They still haven't. This is what the Canadian border looks like. It's gorgeous. If you ever get a chance, go there. I challenge you to cross the border several times as you're walking through the woods here. It's a lot of fun. All right, so some of the immigration issues. There's uh, entry without inspection. These are people that just sneak across the border, obviously. And there's people that do it by different means. Check out those tires. 
And everybody that crosses the border is processed through the IAFIS system. It's the integrated automated fingerprint identification system. It takes your photograph. It takes your, I think it's the right index finger, if I remember right. I think it is. And it stores it in the database. And as you go through, every time you get arrested, you get a new fingerprint, a new photograph. So it just keeps adding into your file because fingerprints don't change. Photographs change a little bit. Is this all the same person? Yes. But it's Jose or Josie. This was 23 arrests between March of 2002 and September of 2008. Jo Jose and Josie isn't her real name. Obviously, I couldn't use her real name, and, but she's probably still around. Another cool way to get into the United States is by tunnel. Digging down, you'd be surprised at how good the soil is in California and uh, Arizona to dig down, a couple of buildings across the border, tunneling out. It's amazing the construction that they do. Um, it's it's just flabbergasting just to see it. It's unbelievable. Tunneling was, is a big deal. Um, obviously, when we find one, we've got to cement it off. Well, we have to go down there and make sure nobody's down there when we cement it off. It takes a coordination from the Mexican authorities to seal off their end which a lot of times they're not really all that willing to do. Some of the other issues are overstays. Overstays arriving in the United States lawfully, they process through, they're inputted into the systems. There are visitors, business people, but they're also like become ship jumpers. They're failing or quitting students who arrive to go to school, flunk out. They're temporary workers, such as like in places like Myrtle Beach, where all the hotels um, hire Russian maids that work all summer long. A lot of those maids come uh, September and October, just kind of disappear into the woodwork. Uh, they don't get on their flights to go back home. And the other one is religious workers. So religious workers can be anybody that says, I'm a religious person of such and such religion. And we do a lot of smuggling, people smuggling. This is a car that crossed the border. A couple of people just kind of dug themselves in and it's tight quarters, but people do it all the time. This is a big old tractor trailer. It looks pretty normal, nondescript. Could be a water tanker, could be a fuel tanker. There's a fan in the bottom of it. This is what we saw when we x-rayed it. So that kind of gave us a little hint that something wasn't right. Narcotic smuggling. So you see a guy with great abs. Yeah, this was not a guy with great abs. This was a gentleman that I caught in Laredo, I think. I think it was Laredo. Um, 92, 97 condoms full of cocaine in his body. Um, his intestines full of cocaine. I mean, you can see his intestines all the way down to his anus, all the way up through his whole cavity of balloons. Um, had one of those bursts, he would have died easily. Um, he was caught because, one, he could barely talk because he was so dehydrated. He'd had no food for five or six days. Plus he was, all he could do was take tiny, tiny little sips of water, which was very odd to watch. It's like, why are you, take a drink of water, you know, go drink. And he says, I am. And then you got clowns like this in an ultralight. This is awesome. This is taken from one of our Huey helicopters, or uh, excuse me, not a Huey. Um, I can't remember the types of helicopters we use. Uh, flying across the border, he's in an ultralight. 
very ingenious, all packed with marijuana. He doesn't uh, keep up very well with helicopters. And then you got to import things like golf balls full of heroin. Every boat that's manufactured since about 20 years from now has to have every void space accountable for. So you've got to have access and entry into every area of a boat. And that includes the little boats like this one all the way up to freighters. So when you see it sealed off like this, it's like, oh, okay, we got to cut into this. And you cut into it and sure enough, there's what you find. Tell them what that is. That's a, that's, that's a cocaine blocks. I think we have some, mar there was some marijuana in this boat too that came up. You can see the marijuana in the back. This is a truck crossing, a cattle crossing. Cattle shifts between Texas and Arizona into Mexico quite often. It's very common. There's certain ways I got to import and export cattle. Very common. What's not so common is they cut open the floor and they lay nice packages of marijuana and cocaine in there. And then they let put the cover the floor back up, let the cows all poop over the cocaine and everything and, and uh, sell it to your greatest dealers. Then you got people that get all kinds of craziness with let's fruits and vegetables. Let's put drugs in the fruits and vegetables. Pretty easy to detect. They get pretty complex. Here's a shipment involving, um, I believe it was oatmeal, if I remember right. When you x-ray it, you got three nice, or three nice pallet folds of, of oatmeal, and then you got this saggy old thing with these white bars in it. And it's like the x-ray take capabilities that they have nowadays, unbelievable. Literally, they just drove this truck through the x-ray machine. It doesn't take but a couple of seconds to produce these photographs. They can color code it with different textures of uh, x-ray combinations. And you can see the drugs very easily amongst the uh, oatmeal. Currency smuggling. This is a body carry. It's pretty common. It happens all the time. Uh, the guy on the left's pretty good. The guy on the right could have done a little better. Um, but they don't, it's not as flexible as your skin. So all you got to do is like, just put your hand on a guy's thigh because you're having a conversation with him and you can like, oh, that's not right. Here's a young picture of me back in 1997 with $890,000, I think it was. A couple of my coworkers. This is not a very good picture, but you can see on the tinfoil, it's like this yellowish substance. They try to mask the smell of currency with mustard. You know, dogs know how to smell mustard. They know how to smell currency. Another tractor trailer. I can't remember where this crossed. Again, it was sealed in the floor. Just blocks and blocks of currency. Uh, 329,000 seized from the cab that was in a suitcase. Uh, more than a quarter million in the, or more than a million in the nose of the trailer. This is a vehicle, a car vehicle, border crossing. It's just packed up into the rear bench seat of a, probably an SUV or a minivan. They stick it in side walls in the cargo area. I mean, they're usually pretty creative where they can stack it, but and push push it. Currency's pretty easy to smell with a, a canine. They're pretty good at the, the money. They're good with drugs too, but another eight hundred and sixty-four thousand dollars in a door panel. It's all the same same case. This was packed in Tide uh, laundry detergent. 
thinking, oh, dogs can't smell through the laundry detergent. Well, guess what? They can. This is, this is a picture that wasn't taken, to my knowledge, was not taken by customs. This floated around the internet. Some of you may have seen it. We think it came out of a Mexican cartel area. Um, the best we can tell is this is about a 10 foot by 10 foot area of currency. You can see the stacks of money there, obviously, and that's why we think it's a drug cartel photograph, but th the source of this photograph is really unknown. Firearm smuggling. If you're going to put firearms in a container like this, make sure you repaint the whole thing, put new stickers on. You just don't paint over where you re-welded it. And then if you got to put a firearm or something in there, you know, make sure you plug it with something good. So when you undo the plug, you can't just look in and it's supposed to be a void area. You see all kinds of clothes and crap. And, you know, I guess he couldn't find another shipping box to send his, his, uh, clothing back home, so we packed it all in there. We pulled out handguns out of there, lots of rifles, that sort of thing. All that was in that one container? Yep, all that was in that one box area, one, one. Uh, That's a lot. They, um, they buy weapons here, you know, illegals buy weapons here, smuggle them back to their countries because it's good profit overseas for the weaponry. This was a shipment that was smuggled in with um, other cargo uh, that are a bunch of, you know, obviously a bunch of German handguns. And, you know, it was just commingled with very erroneous kind of other boxes. So you wouldn't have noticed it. Counterfeit products. This is a big deal. Counterfeit drugs. They're all over the internet. I'm sure every person here has had an invite to buy some. This is what me and Harold use daily. This is a uh, synthetic Viagra. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it comes in packages like this. This one was a FedEx shipment. Why are you calling this is, out Harold? I'm just calling out Harold because I love him. You know, this is how this crap comes in. I call it crap because it really is poorly manufactured. These are, these are terrible pictures, but these are labs of manufacturing the drugs that are illegally manufactured and brought into the United States. They're filthy. There's no quality control. Um, I, I don't even trust buying drugs if I went to Canada. I said, no, I'm going to bring all my stuff with me. You know, it's... You mean prescription meds? Prescription meds. Um, well, they have, you know, I mean, look at the conditions here. They're horrible, dusty and nasty. And, but then you get into things like counterfeit purses. Um, I'm sure every woman that on this blog here has bought a counterfeit purse in their life. Jamie has to, uh -huh. she don't let her tell you she has. I, I buy a new one every week. <laughs> Just to go with the new heels. You know, there. You, you look at it as like harmless, and it really kind of is. But the in, in, uh, intellectual property rights that go in with Gucci bags, and the copyrights, and all that stuff, and it's even with medicines too. Our narcotic industry and pharmaceutical industry spend years and years and years per, uh, perfecting drugs just to have it made with synthetic ingredients overseas. I mean, it's, it's crazy, but okay, you have to stop right here. I have to interject and tell a quick story. I used to sell high end women's clothing. That's been one of my many facets of career. And I had a client here and she was making a rather large purchase. She had about a $4,000 Louis Vuitton bag. Terry comes in while we're working on the transaction. She pulls her wallet out to give me her credit card. And Terry says, that's a counterfeit wallet. And she said, yeah, but my bag is real. I didn't care what was in the actual handbag. Yeah, I, <laughs> she wasn't happy and um, almost lost that sale. I said, don't ever do that again. I didn't mean to call her out, but it was just blatant, I guess. I don't know. Bad Terry, bad Terry. Uh, Nike shoes. 
you know, again, Nike spends a lot of money protecting their products. Uh, Disney, Disney is vicious when it comes to counterfeit products. They will go after you in a heartbeat. Um, Rolex was very, very strong for a bunch of years. And then Rolex realized like, you know, if someone's walking around with a counterfeit Rolex valued at $45 and somebody thinks it's a real one, somebody may go buy a real one. So why should we go after the guy with a $45 Rolex? And they just kind of threw up their hands on it about, you know, a few years back, really kind of angered us. Counterfeit software, same way, um, has viruses connected to it, has um, um, other areas of that give you links into, into uh, viruses and that sort of stuff. Counterfeit documents, you know, social security cards, I'll bet I've seized a thousand of them. Uh, driver's licenses, counterfeit driver's licenses, all the time, they're a dime a dozen. These ones are a little more interesting when they start doing a visa, or excuse me, a passport. You know, you can see the two different colors here at the edges. You know, they're pretty good, pretty good likeness. You pull it up a little more and obviously it's a different picture with a different guy and a different name and that sort of thing, but. I, I spent a lot of my career doing child exploitation. Obviously, I'm not going to show you any child pornography because I don't have any, but it's a huge, huge industry. It's very, very profitable for criminals. Um, sex travelers are the same way. Basically, it's the long sh short of it is if you travel for sex, you're in violation. Sex trafficking, you know, is pretty common. You come, you bring, they recruit people from overseas. They bring them here, offer them good jobs. You know, you're going to work for me doing what I want you to do until you pay off your smuggling fees. Forced labor, child sweatshops, forced child labor. I mean, this doesn't happen so much in America, but overseas it's quite prevalent. Um, we still work a lot of these kind of crimes. This was soccer balls. Um, back about when the World Cup was in the United States, and I want to say it was about 1994, 95% of the soccer balls were made in Pakistan by children doing this exact same technique. You know, the soccer ball has to be hand stitched. It has to be flipped inside out. It takes little tiny fingers to do it. Moving bricks. Children do it all the time. We work with a lot of criminal gangs, violent street gangs, organized crime, Russian mobs, Muslim Brotherhood. Here's MS-13. These guys are usually pretty easy to identify. Some are even more easier than others. They get caught processed, kicked out, they're back in the United States very quickly. They, they tag a lot of areas. This was taken right down the street from my house, the Surios 13. And here are some of our favorite organized crime guys. They were literally the first. They really did very good job and they are very well organized. Do not sell them short, do not trust them. They're not our friends, they're not motorcycling friends. Council on American Islamic Relations. This, this slide got me in trouble a while back when uh, I was doing this presentation because, oh, that's a professional organization. Well, no, it's not. Um, I had enough intelligence background and knowledge of this organization. It's not a professional organization. It's a terrorist organization and should be treated as such. Unfortunately, in the United States, it's not treated as such. And we welcome them with open arms in our country. Suicide body bombers, you know, walking through x-rays, they're pretty good. These are crappy pictures. Walking through x-rays are pretty good at seeing the stuff. We've all been through the x-rays in the airports by now. It's, it's pretty easy to find things. This was one of the most major decisions we had to do every day. And it was one of our really? most difficult ones. Really? Where are we going to eat? It was always, always a tough decision when you got eight or nine agents together, where are we going to eat? 
And of course, you got guys like this say, well, they can't deport us all. That's true. We can't, we didn't, and we still haven't. So getting back to my motorcycling life, this is uh, my Road King on uh, Tail of the Dragon one year. It was a nice bike. I loved it. It was 18 years old. I bought it for uh, uh, $16,000. I drove it for 18 years. It was almost ready to get an antique license plate on it. And uh, I went to get a new tire on it to, for a trip to Texas. And uh, so I called my wife and I said, Jamie, come pick me up at the Harley shop. And uh, because I'm dropping a bike off, get a new tire because we're going, going to Texas, blah, blah, blah. So looking around the Harley shop, this salesman taps me on the shoulder. I'm talking to a service guy. He taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, uh, you want to sell the bike? I'm going, no, not really. I'm, I'm getting a new tire on it. He says, he says, I, I saw you were looking at the new motorcycles there. And I said, yeah, I was looking at them. I always look at them. He said, um, I said, but they're too hot now. Um, we drove one in Texas, or excuse what me, bike? we drove one in Arizona what, what on a rent bike, and it was way too hot. What bike? It was the Ultra Classic Thank when, when, he, when we were in Vegas. So he said, well, the Ultra Classics are water-cooled now. And I go, what? How really? What do you mean? So I get, I, the guy comes back a few minutes later. I'm still talking to the service rep. He says, look, we can give you six thousand dollars for your motorcycle i said i bought this motorcycle 18 years ago for sixteen thousand dollars he says yeah we'll give you six thousand dollars for your motorcycle if you apply it to a new bike so i look across the showroom and here's my wife hovering a sold sign over my new motorcycle that this is also on a taylor dragon but <laughs> i bought him a bike so she bought me the motorcycle she claims i did <laughs> So we bought a new motorcycle, Ultra Classic. We love it. We don't get to ride it enough. Blah, 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 blah. And I negotiated in the deal. I said, I'll take the bike today, cash, if I get a $1,000 credit for clothing in the store. He shook my hand. And they gave it to him. Harold, this was low country. I'm going, low country doesn't give anything away. Was it counterfeit, was it counterfeit um, uh, apparel? <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> We know this guy. So this is this is at Jerry. I'm trying to remember. Was this at Atlanta or was this at um, Toronto? This is Toronto. You yeah. you showed up with uh, one of those little cups, like every I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> I think I sampled absolutely every bottle you had at least twice. Well, I think you did. I think Chris Jones had a few bottles too, but Chris was no, pretty not busy. Bottles. Uh, yeah, nips. little samplings. Little nips. Chris was always busy, busier than I was. I was able to walk around and chat with people a little bit. Okay, and this is Jerry's bike, right? Yeah, this yeah. is Jerry's bike. Do you still have that one? Oh, yeah, it's coming oh. this weekend. Oh, okay, oh, yeah. excellent. So th this is, that's my presentation. I uh, appreciate you listening. I'll, I'll take any kind of questions you got. Hope I wasn't too boring. I have a question. Hey, Terry. Yeah. So those onslaught of people coming across the border in San Ysidro, were those basically just people from Mexico coming here or a number of visitors from our country there coming back? You know, any idea what kind of relationship there? You, you can pretty much count on about 50-50. Um, oh, okay. All right. The, the returning travelers from, especially the big border crossings in the big towns, um, are, are U.S. citizens living in the United States or Mexicans living in the United States, working in Mexico. There's a yeah. lot of daily crossers. Um, in fact, the daily, daily worker crossings, they have a special ID card that they show. Um, and pretty much they show that thing and they just waved on, you know. It's well, San Ysidro was kind of scary. I was doing my Four Corners tour around the country and I stopped there for gas and I got scared. You know, I called my wife and I said, look, I think I took a wrong turn or made a mistake, but I'm south of the border and I shouldn't be down here because I, no one understands English. And she laughed at me. 
And she said, impossible. <laughs> you could not have gotten into Mexico. You could not have passed the border patrol without, you know, going through. And sure enough, I wasn't. I was in San Ysidro, but it was not a very comfortable feeling. It was a very hostile environment. There. Yeah, you can't, you can't make that mistake crossing a border. You know when you cross the border, unless you're obviously doing it illegally, you're swimming or something, climbing over a fence, you know. But I do have a dual sport feeling, bike. But he was already feeling the vibe. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, this is not a place I want to be. No. It wasn't a place that I like to work. I mean, when I was there. It was, it was kind of wild. Good presentation. Thank you. Anybody yes, else? When you, um, when you're, you know, in that large of a facility and stuff like that, how often were you finding something? Daily? Hourly? Oh, weekly? hourly. Hourly. Hourly? Yeah. Wow. Um, probably more like three or four times an hour. And, and where's where is this at? Where were you stationed at there? Well, th that big p photograph of all the lanes that was at San Ysidro. Where's that at? Which California? Yeah, yeah. Very south. Um, Very southern. I spent I spent a good bit of time in Laredo and Yuma, um, and Yuma had at the time I think they had four border crossings. I think they have five now. Um, hmm. When I was in Laredo, which was very early on, they only had about four lanes. Um, now they're bigger, but and it, you know these things run twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. So you've got manpower issue, you got canine issues. It's hot. Canines can only work a few hours a day. I mean, it's it's a logistical nightmare. So, so all that cash that you had in those pictures, is that real money or is some of it counterfeit? Um, no, that's all real money. That's so all some, real money. They, you're sending it here to launder no, it or? No, you, drugs come in, cash goes out. Okay. Tell them what you do with the pot. Just burn it. Burn it. It's fun, but that's fun. Yeah, I mean, marijuana, marijuana normally gets burned. Most, any drugs that we see in, in the United States is, is destroyed by burning normally. I mean, you know, some of our very big, huge incinerators. Um, I've got a, a funny story about um, I did a seizure of R22, which is a gas for air conditioning units. R22 was determined not to be a but was phased out by EPA uh, probably 10, 12 years ago now. There still are 22 air conditioners all over the country. It got smuggled in. We had a big seizure of it. I ended up seizing all these tanks of R22 gas. And then it was kind of like, okay, how do we destroy it? Well, you can't destroy Freon gas by cutting it loose into the atmosphere because the EPA won't let you do that. EPA says you can't burn it. Turns out there's only one person or one person in the United States that has the technical capability of destroying the stuff safely. And it was going to cost, um, I don't know, you know, four or $5,000 per container or excuse me, per bottle. I had probably 800 bottles of this stuff. To, uh, to process it. So, you know, Homeland Security said, well, you know, we can't pay that. We're not going to pay that. So, I mean, there was not, no other way around it. And basically it's like, okay, Department of Defense, can you guys use any of this R-22 for the next 40 years? And Department of Defense says, oh, sure. Yeah, give it to us. You know, so it went to them. But sometimes you get those products that are difficult to destroy and or cost prohibited to destroy. I would love to interject. Go ahead. My wife wants to interject. Uh oh, no shit. So you <laughs> you, you saw the professional side of Terry. Um, I'm very proud to say that we are a third generation Rotarian family. His father was a Rotarian. Uh, a president two times over, brought women into Rotary before they were allowed. He almost got kicked out of his home club. 
Mm. Um, our, our daughter, my stepdaughter, is also a Rotarian, which makes us three generations. He's very, very committed to his family. Um, he's very committed to Rotary to the point that a lot of times he'll put Rotary before his family and his honey to list. It took me 14 years to decide to get married again. Um, and I chose him and he chose me. And uh, you've got a good guy, good guy in your, in your club and he'll do anything you guys ask of him. I love Rotary. I mean, it's, it's been a great, you know, I, I joined right at the right time. It was just in the time that I was retiring and needed something else to take care of and do and have fun with. And it was, it was perfect for me. And then we, then we discovered they didn't have a, a whiskey fellowship. And <laughs> Jamie and I said, okay, let's start one. And well, little do we know, it's like, it's more, it's more difficult than starting a rotary club. Really? But we wouldn't change a thing. But we wouldn't change a thing. That's right. We need to compare notes sometimes but since I'm walking into this presidency thing. <laughs> how difficult it is to do a rotary club no i just interested how you manage yours and such and and uh and in terms of because i'm stepping in here on in about two weeks whatever to be the uh, president of the chapter of ifmr it's you know jerry i mean you i'm sure that you have a lot of times when it's yes dear i'll take care of it you know but i got to take care of this first and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just happens. But I want to welcome anybody to come and visit us in Charleston. Harold and I will will uh, entertain you, and we have places for you to stay and, and areas that you can keep your motorcycle secure and dry. And we'll treat you so many ways, you'll be bound to like one of them. <laughs> yeah. Careful like that invite. I'm on the road next week. <laughs> well, you're more than welcome. Hey, Jerry, if you got yeah. a sec, Tom here. Yo. Yeah, Jerry, can you you and Linda stay on for a minute or two after the meeting concludes? Not very long. I'm behind the eight ball here, getting ready to get out of here in the morning. I won't even take a minute, but I'll just wait okay. till the meeting's over. Thank you. Actually, the board members, any board members on here? We just need a quick vote. Hi, Harold. Yeah. I don't know if we got enough, but we don't have to do it by email. Anybody else have questions for Terry? No? I, I do. So, Terry, Jamie said you'll do anything we ask of you. <laughs> Here <laughs> it comes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, your ankles. So, so hop on your motorcycle tomorrow morning and come on up to the windy, windy nine. <laughs> well, I got to I'm doing a second job tomorrow, which is a new job for me and Jamie. We're both uh, Charleston is filming like three different TV productions in Charleston, and we've been signing up as extras on TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're cast. I, I'm a deacon tomorrow. I hope the church doesn't burn down. <laughs> Oh, bolts of lightning coming. Yeah. <laughs> What's your line? So watermelon, you watermelon, 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 watermelon. <laughs> and, and since you and Harold live close together, I'm guessing you guys have ridden together already? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Over the years. Sure. Terry brought Harold into our club. Yeah. yeah. Harold and I were back in a motor, in a law enforcement motorcycling club years and years ago, and and uh, so they kicked me out. We didn't kick you out. <laughs> well, that explains a lot. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a non-American bike. Not the blue. So I, I felt I had to get him into another get him into another motorcycling club. I felt guilty. <laughs> okay. Well, Thank you very uh, much, Terry. Good to be back in the meeting just for a moment, at least. <laughs> great, great. Uh, presentation. John came on at the last minute. Hello. 
I just came back from dinner with the daughter doctorates. You're late. <laughs> no, we had a wonderful dinner. You guys didn't. You guys missed out. What does your Are shirt you say? Uh, they the only ones that came in early, John. Oh, was, yeah, they came in uh, this afternoon, and uh, they're here till Monday. Oh, nice. What does your shirt say? Uh, I can't. It says, uh, "Yes, I've made mistakes." Life doesn't come with instructions, but even if it did, I wouldn't follow them anyway. Very good. All right. Harold, I thought you were at a BMW convention. I was. Yeah, I just got back Sunday. I was there since last Wednesday. In that Lebanon, means you, Tennessee. you get up here. No, I've got, I've got a golf tournament Friday. Oh, man. Division of labor, to, you know. <laughs> what have we been talking about today? You missed a really good presentation by Terry, so you're going to have to watch the, the recording. Yes. What, what was the presentation? It's very, wor it's very worth watching the recording, John. For sure. All what about was? Terry. All about Terry. All about Terry. Well, ah. well. Sounds and you're smuggling, and how you used to smuggle things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, watch the presentation, John. Lots of photographs. It's fun. And won't, you won't go to sleep. And, the, and then he talked about destroying the drugs that he found by burning it, and I'm assuming you burned it in little tiny paper wafers, right? Uh, no. no, 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 no. More like tractor trailer <laughs> loads. <laughs> it's currency. So use the big paper out of the old Cheech and Chong album. <laughs> well, you know, Cuban cigars were a big deal a bunch of years ago. Oh, and yeah. Those were destroyed by fire. Yep. Wow. In fact, marijuana burns so hot that the uh, power plants that we used to take tractor trailer loads to dispose of would kick us, literally kick us out of town and ask us never to come back because we would burn out the, I guess, carbon tips that ignited the, in, in the steel, molten steel process. And they said cannabis burns so much hotter, it um, really destroyed part of their production. So we would have to find a different city that would allow us to transport the marijuana and hashish there to burn. <laughs> Most people don't think of things like that. Yeah, I have, I have no clue what hashish or marijuana smell like. Just walk through Seattle. You know, you, you you'll know. It's very, very discernible. Harold, I was in as an enlisted man in the army in the seventies. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, I was in Copenhagen last week, and I went to this oh, little God. called Christiana. It's it's kind of an area that the police ignore. Yeah. You, Ashley, they have booze right there oh, on the wall. Okay. Selling hashish, marijuana, whatever you want. Uh, who am I talking to? <laughs> and I know you've never smelled it. No, no. You just gotta walk. We were there too, several years ago, <laughs> and they keep out the hard stuff. They kind of self police. It's an interesting place. Quick question. How many of you had had the album that I was talking about, Cheech and Chong album with the paper in it? <laughs> oh, yeah. How many remember that album? How many still have the album? No. I might still have the eight track. The eight track? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> nothing to play it on. I have to dig it out. I still got the Indian Decada De Vida album. That's all one side, you know. One of the world's great songs. Yes. Four words. <laughs> All right. Does anybody have anything else for today? Next week's happy hour. And you want to, who did you need? Next week, and then I think we're off the phone for the first week. I'll be back from vacation on the 6th of July, ready to go.
Cool. No, I just need the board members to hang out for a few minutes after. Hey, did anybody hear how Brian did on his uh, exam? No, no I we're talking text. about that. No news. Send him a text. He hasn't responded yet. He's probably sleeping. Linda, stop the recording. He died your dungeon real loud there, pal.